In 2007, a group of Australian film students came together to create a spoof trailer for a movie that never existed. The supposedly lost film was called Italian Spider-Man and drew inspiration from other absurd takes on famous superheroes for international markets, such as the Japanese Spider-Man and Turkish Spider-Man. The trailer was an internet sensation and a fully-fledged web series soon followed. From my understanding, Italian Spider-Man seems to be really good and, to be honest, it would be way too perfect to follow a video featuring Bizarro Spider-Man and a video on a spoof show with a third video on a spoof show featuring a Bizarro Spider-Man. Which is why I'm not talking about Italian Spider-Man today. Instead, I'll be talking about what the creators did next. Because, you see, Australian channel SPS approached Italian Spider-Man creators David Ashby and Dario Russo with the intention of adapting the project for television. But the rights proved difficult to clear, making the proposal fall apart. Still, SBS kept in touch with Ashby and Russo, offering them the opportunity to develop a new show for the network. What resulted from this partnership was the story of an elite military task force known as Danger 5. The creators described the series as basically a live-action adaptation of Men's Adventures magazines, a genre of publication that flourished between the 1940s and 1970s and featured pulp-style tales of wartime adventure in exotic places, often interleaved by pin-up girls. Danger 5 carries on the torch of this long-forgotten genre, and by caring, I mean mercilessly mocking it. The show is a parody of 1960s media in general, every episode spoofing a specific trope popular in lowbrow fiction of the period, like super spies, Amazon warriors, lost civilizations, satanic cults, genetically engineered dinosaur people, giant monsters, all of that always brought forward by those pesky Nazis. It's the job of the men and women of Danger 5 to stop the plans of Adolf Hitler to win the war. These men and women are, par for the course, highly efficient killing machines that rarely shed a tear over the massive amount of lives lost during their adventure. They spend their missions drinking and smoking, as if the fate of the free world wasn't hanging on the balance or something. This seems a super straightforward if extremely quirky, description of the kind of media the show aims to emulate. The curveball here comes from the part where their boss has the head of an eagle, they visit a nightclub frequented by monkey men and German shepherds talk, well, German. And no one bats an eye on any of these things. Yeah, the humor of this show leans heavily on the surreal, escalating the ridiculous premise of the episodes with even more ridiculous set pieces that wouldn't feel out of place in a cartoon. Literally, in one instance. What's the matter, Tucker? Chicken? <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Kilroy. <laughs> Add to that the low budget aesthetic of the whole thing, and I would be repeating what I said about Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Go watch that video, I know you didn't. Just like that other show from the review you didn't watch, the real strength of Danger 5 lies on its characters, the members of the titular team. Even while in the heat of their bizarre missions, the characters find a way of shining through their quirks and relationships. We have Tucker, the super uptight Australian, always laser focused on the mission at hand. Because of that, he's completely incapable of declaring his infatuation for Claire, the British agent who is even more uptight than Tucker. Her aggressive prudeness prevents her from declaring out loud to Tucker she feels the same way as him, making her grow increasingly anxious about his lack of initiative. These two stuffy dogs are balanced out by their polar opposites, Jackson and Yuza. Yuza is a super liberated Russian femme fatale who managed to drink even more than her already heavy drinking buddies. It's this ass-kicking persona that captured the love of Jackson, the hard-boiled American cowboy who despite his super macho characterization is incapable of getting over the fact Yuza doesn't care about him and gets heartbroken, sometimes aggressively so, at his mate's get-aroundness. Finally, rounding up the team is Pierre, the suave, easygoing European, 
where from Europe it's never actually disclosed, that has a talent for making friends wherever he goes. These friends often die on his very arms, much to his sadness. It is easy to dismiss the agents of Danger 5 at first, considering how relatively low-key they are when compared to all the wackness that goes on around them, which, as I mentioned before, is by design and where a lot of the humor of the show comes from. The more you get exposed to these five unusual companions though, the more they grow on you. The creators must have realized that as well, which explains why the second season amps up the dramatic aspect of this story, more on that in a moment. So this is Danger 5, a very unique parody of 1960s media that managed to combine interesting characters with hilarious set pieces with great results. But once the war was over and Hitler had been dealt with, what was left for the men and women of Danger 5? Where could the show go next? <laughs> Season 2 of Danger 5 moves the action to the 1980s. 60s spy fiction is yesterday's news. Now the order of the day is high schools, slashers, zombies, cold war and time travel all set during a perpetual Christmas Eve. Usually, I would be the first to complain how 1980s tropes and parodies are done to death in modern media, and personally, that whole decade can jump off a cliff or something. But in this case, I let it slide, because there is no way the second season would have ever reached the heights it did if it wasn't trying to channel the distorted zeitgeist of the decade. Everything from the previous season is amped up to 11. The action gets even more purposeful. The visuals take several levels in techness and, perhaps most importantly, the characters get completely consumed by their oddities. Jackson has PTSD from the time a guy gave him a BJ on Vietnam and has developed an unhealthy obsession with Yuza, who on her end has sank even deeper into a debauched lifestyle while working for the Russian government. Claire is unsatisfied with her marriage with Tucker who is as unsurfably stuffy as ever, and Pierre has become an international music star for whom life has become a constant party filled with excess and is now black. These five go from quirky but effective to completely dysfunctional, barely holding it together as they chase Hitler and his minions around the globe. The story of season 2 is highly serialized, with each episode building on where the last one left off which allows for the characters to actually change and react to what is happening around them. Near the end of the season, the team takes a brief detour to interact with their past selves from season 1. It is a great how far we've come kind of moment that will almost certainly warm your heart. This last sentence makes it feel as if the show is all mopey and stuff, so let me reiterate how season 2 is absolutely off the wall deranged. Another side effect of serialization is that the action also builds up over time, allowing for a crescendo of insanity, as Hitler's plans grow in scale and so do our heroes' responses to them. A lot of people dislike season 2 exactly because of its reliance on absurd jokes, to which I say this is bullshit. They managed to maintain the show on the high gear for 7 episodes, one better than the other, up to a glorious finale that makes justice to the show's bonkers run. It is a remarkable feat that guarantees Danger 5's place in the house of great comedies in television and why you should definitely take a look at it if you haven't done so already. I don't know how to end this, the next one is a movie, I promise. <laughs>